bad jokes. What's that? Um, I just, uh, you know, if we're going to start, uh, someone pointed out to me that I seem to talk about chocolate a lot as well. So let's combine dad jokes and chocolate. My favorite headline from yesterday was man who stole 200,000 Cadbury cream eggs jailed for 18 months. If you're a headline writer, what headline are you going to give it? Foiled. She did warn you. Anna warned you, you can't, you can't blame her. So we, we're, again, a slight change of gear today, where we're going to take some of the theological stuff that we've thought about in the last three days, about what it means to be human as creatures and as sinners, and we're going to bring it to bear in thinking about one of the most pressing ethical issues um, in our world today, which is that the word of the day is transhumanism. I learned a lot about sign language. Well, I didn't learn a lot about sign language. So that's, you know, that's another insight into me where, where my wife would just look at me and go, oh, instant expert. Um, I learned a lot about sign language by talking to our signers at the convention and talking about how, how are we going to sign what transhumanism is? Because sign language is a very concrete thing. And so I think they came up with something robotic in the end. Um, whereas transhumanism is just a sort of abstract word. But I'm going to try and talk about what that means as we go through. It is the thing that is already upon us and that increasingly is coming down the pike in terms of thinking about what it means to be human. And what it does is it promises an upgrade. Humanity 1.0 has not been terribly impressive, has it? I mean, it has in lots of ways, actually, but it but it's also not been terribly impressive, and so what we need is an upgrade to humanity 2.0 and a better way of being human. So let's start by just thinking about why people would think that. We're creatures, and we're fallen creatures, and therefore we are dependent, weak, vulnerable, and corrupt. And weakness is fundamental to human experience. As creatures made from nothing, we depend utterly on God for everything. And God has created us in such a way that our lives unfold slowly over time in networks of dependency. I mean, that's in some ways what our relationships are, aren't they? Networks of mutual dependency. Mutual gift and love. Uh, part of which is needed because we are dependent on one another, family, neighbors, church, the rest of creation, armies, uh, medicine. If you want to think for a moment about how frail, maybe you don't want to think about how frail and limited and dependent you are, but imagine for a moment how you'd feel after not drinking anything for a whole day. Uh, and then trying to walk up a hill. By the end of yesterday, I could barely make it up the little slope to the hotel, let alone climbing a proper hill after not drinking anything for a day. Think about how it feels to, uh, to live for weeks without getting enough sleep. Think about how easy it is to get your feelings hurt and to be left feeling winded and wounded and confused and in turmoil from sometimes the most casual comment. Think about how hard it is to be lonely and isolated from those you love. Think about the effects of aging and the growing army of aches and pains and wrinkles and stiffness and minor maladies and more serious diagnoses. Think about losing someone you love and the way you're just left shattered and bereft. Think back a few months and think about how cold you felt this winter, possibly in your own home. How many layers of clothing you had to wear. Think about how much you grumbled when the weather became really hot. It only takes a few degrees change in temperature, doesn't it? A, to kick off that bad British habit about moaning about the weather, 
and B, to expose our frailty and vulnerability. Think about your longings and your unfulfilled desires. All the things that when you were in your teens and 20s, you really hoped you would get out of life. Think about how you ache for different things in life to change. Dependence, weakness, vulnerability is just fundamental and inescapable. Fundamental and inescapable part of being human. And I don't think any of us cope with it really well. I suspect this is a besetting part of the human condition. But we do live in a society that is really bad at coping with weakness and limitation. And here's where technology kicks in. We live uh, in a technological society. I'm going to explain what I mean by that uh, in a moment. The, the phrase comes from the, the French sociologist Jacques Ellul, who wrote a book called, well, translated as The Technological Society back in the 60s, that is still a sort of classic uh, examination of not just technology, because we'll think about technology in a moment, but a, a society that is dominated and governed and awash with technology. So what is a technological society? Well, let's think about the promise of technology for a moment. All humans and all cultures and societies use technologies. Going right back to however far back you think we're going with our ancestors. I mean, actually, I, I, one of the nice things about sitting in the grounds of Salisbury Cathedral is there are lots of jackdaws there. And I quite enjoy just watching the jackdaws strutting around like they own the place. Like these sort of the bother boys of the birds world. And actually, they're quite clever in terms of the things they can use. Um, sticks and stones as, as sort of crude tools. Then you go back to our ancestors and the sort of Stone Age and Bronze Age. You know, I've got a son who now we live in so we're near some flinty kind of uh, rocks. And so it's fun. I remember it as an eight-year-old boy, the fun of our oh, flints and napping flints and trying to make uh, arrowheads. Wheels, bows and arrows, farming implement, pens and paper. Uh, the printing press. So all cultures and societies used technologies in various ways. Fire. But our relationship to technology underwent a step change in the Industrial Revolution in the 18th century, and then into the 20th century, and now into the 21st century. So that as Alil explains it, we no longer live in a society with technologies, uh, which would have been true in the pre-modern world, now we live in a society dominated by technology which seeks not just to help our weaknesses, but to overcome it completely. So that's what technology is for. It's, it's to help us overcome limitations and weaknesses and do things uh, better, stronger, faster, with more dexterity and skill. But a technological society is a society where we don't just use certain limited technologies for particular purposes to overcome some weakness, to help our weaknesses, but where technology offers the promise of overcoming all weakness completely. And Elul talks about, therefore analyzes the difference between a society that uses technology and a technological society and points out that technological mediation, that doing everything through technology, is the world we swim in. So that almost every aspect of life is mediated by technology. That's a really good thing. Uh, I was frustrated that instead of taking me five and a half hours to get to Keswick, it took me eight hours to get to Keswick because of Birmingham. But I had a great technology to help me. I mean, my car's old and clapped out, but it's still a better technology than my feet for getting me to Keswick. And even if I'd had to do it with my feet, I would have still had a, a useful technology called shoes that I'd have had very sore feet, but they wouldn't have been cut to ribbons by the ground as I walked here. So technological mediation is a good thing. Uh, as I visited my mum recently, and we were able to talk with one of my daughters on FaceTime. 
That's a precious thing. It was better when my daughter, a few weeks later, was able to go and visit in person. But even then, she went by train. So living in a technological society brings great benefits. And I, as, and I don't want to be heard as being anti-technology in, in what I'm saying. However, it shapes the way we interact with the rest of the world. Um, and it therefore shapes who we are as people and how we experience ourselves and what we hope for and what we think we can avoid or achieve. We shape our tools, and then our tools shape us. And if you live in a society with technology where the, the tools are smaller and more limited, that's probably okay because you're, you're constantly working with things that are roughly on a human scale. If anyone's familiar with the work of Wendell Berry, uh, the American writer and farmer, he would talk about the difference that the, the introduction of tractors brings to farming that begins to separate the farmer from his land in, in a way that when you're working with mules, you're working much more slowly and you have to be attentive to them uh, and the land that you're working. And it's much less efficient. But as soon as you have this big, powerful thing that you can use, Uh, and then you get a combine harvester and the fields get bigger and you need fewer and fewer farmers to work the land, the relationship of farmer and land becomes much less intimate and caring and much more prone to exploitation. And Elul says, in a technological society, it becomes enormously difficult to recognize the natural what God has made and designed in a certain way, as natural rather than just one more example of human choice and design. Because we have so many choices and we can do so many things and we can change and shape the world in such powerful ways um, that when we see something that's natural, we think, well, we've just chosen for it to be like that. And so we get cut off from reality. And so the problem of a technological society is captured by this quotation by Oliver O'Donovan, uh, the greatest living Englishman. Uh, an ethicist, he's now retired. Uh, he was the professor of ethics at, at Oxford for a, a long time and then uh, in the last part of his career in Edinburgh. And O'Donovan says this, it's the standard temptation of a technological culture to conceive even the natural as a special case of artifice, to argue for letting nature take its course simply as the best of all instrumental means towards some humanly chosen end. And O'Donovan, actually, this is in 1984, he uses um, what was then called transsexualism as just an illustration to say, imagine a world in which you think that a man can become a woman and can choose to do so, that has an impact on that man, but then on those around him, what does it mean if you then decide to carry on being a man? That's not then viewed in quite the same way as just naturally inevitable. It becomes a matter of your choice. So there's, there's the, um, the temptation to view natural things as artificial, as just uh, objects of human making and human intention and human design. There's also, Elul talks about the technological imperative. And this is summarized by uh, Lawrence Tulizes. I don't know how you pronounce his name, but Lawrence Tulizes. Talking about Elul, who says, what can be produced must be in a technological society. What can be done must be done. The technological imperative cannot be tempered, tampered with or questioned. It undergirds our entire social order. And I think if you want to understand medical ethics, this is a crucial point to grasp, that we are at the point now where the question is not so much should we do it, but there is such momentum that, as, that the question is not should we do it, the question becomes can we do it, and as soon as we can do it, you are going to need overwhelming objections to stop us from doing it. And I'm going to give you some illustrations in a moment. Not so what can be done must be done. And then Joel Lawrence, a friend of mine, who, who's a bit of an expert on Elul, says this. 
there's, there's not only the technological imperative, that comes with alongside a drive for efficiency. So again, think of any business and management book you have ever read. Think of any careers advice that you've ever been given. Uh, think about the way you try to cut corners and save time and do things quickly and efficiently. Efficiently, and I'm an enemy of efficiency, as my family will tell you. I mean, I'm an energy an energy of efficiency. I'm an en I'm, not, I'm not an energy of efficiency. More coffee. I'm an enemy of efficiency, partly just because I just get away in the way of people trying to be efficient. And my daughter's like, "Oh, Dad, look, everyone seems efficient to you." But also. Relationships are really inefficient, aren't they? If you're doing them right. But Joel Lawrence says this, once the method of efficiency, the one best way, has been discovered, it must be adopted. And the result of that is we come to view human beings as not natural, but as machine-like. We think about artificial intelligence and we compare, we don't just compare artificial intelligence to humans, we compare humans to artificial intelligence. And we discover that actually, in, in certain limited ways, machines are far more intelligent than we are. I mean, they're, they're not, but they can do certain things much better and more efficiently than human beings can. And so we come to view humans as biological machines, in Mary Harrington's word, meat computers. Biological machines that need fixing and upgrading rather than frail creatures of God who need love and patience and care and redemption. Uh, and this kind of desire for efficiency, the drive for efficiency, the prioritizing of our wills and our plans and our decisions rather than the natural order that God has created. Once we prioritize my will, my decisions, my desires, my projects, what's that going to do to my relationship to other human beings? I will start to treat them like machines. And so I was walking along, and I have one of those. I, I just don't care about the fact that I've got an iPhone 7. But I was walking along with a friend who looked across at it and said, what is that? And he had a 12, I think. And he said, I'm about to get a 14. Let me give you, your, let me give you mine. This is, I said, my wife has a 5. You should, you know. What happens when you can no longer get the latest... Uh, update from Apple on your phone, and when some of your apps stop working, and the thing, the battery on this is worse than my battery now, um, and it sort of loses power very quick, well, eventually you just chuck it away, don't you? Upgrade, get something new, something more efficient, something with a better camera, something that can stream things faster. And we begin to think of human beings in the same kind of way. Um, and so I was praying, I'm driving home afterwards, and I just said, I, you know, one of my besetting sins is impatience, especially when I'm behind the wheel of a car. And the, the very unedifying running commentary on the slowness of other drivers. Because they get in the way of me doing what I want to do when I want to do it, at the speed I want to do it. So what does it look like to live in a technological society? Well, in November, there was a news report of something really exciting, I think, that scientists have successfully modified T cells, um, which are part of our sort of immune system, so that they can attack tumors. They're a successful trial with 16 people. So we're quite a long way from this becoming uh, sort of therapeutically viable on a large scale. But 16 people in a trial They've had their T cells modified so that without any other medical in intervention, your immune system can start killing cancer cells. Extraordinary. Everyone's been thinking about chat GPT. My mind was blown uh, two or three years ago when I had a, 
I've got a friend who worked um, in quite a senior position in a large news agency, and he told me in their news agency, they did an experiment where they got their best editors, their most experienced editors, they got their best journalists, and they got AI. Uh, and they got journalists and AI to write stories about the same thing. And then they got the editors to sort of blind test. And 50% of the time, they couldn't guess which was which. Um, in Israel, in I think about November, uh, in an Israeli lab, scientists successfully produced a synthetic mouse embryo uh, using no genetic material from other mice that was able to live, I think it was for about eight days in an artificial uh, womb, which in the way mice developed, there was a heartbeat. And I looked at that at the time and went, wow. Oh, a couple of years' time, that'll be someone human. And I was wrong. I did a bit of digging around, and I learned, actually, that it would, be, would have been legal for them in Israel, in the US, and in the UK to have produced a synthetic human embryo. And I thought, oh, give it a couple of years. Happened a couple of weeks ago in Cambridge. Uh, a, com a, a completely synthetic human embryo was created with no human parents. So remember what I said, not should we do it, but can we do it? And of course, then you do your sort of utilitarian or consequentialist calculus and you say, if we produce these synthetic embryos, we're not really harming anyone, and think of all the things we could do with this genetic material to provide the therapeutic benefits. And I'm sitting there as a kind of theologian and an ethicist going, I don't even know if those embryos are human or not. Because, I, because part of the definition of being human, as I was talking about original sin yesterday, those who naturally descend from uh, Adam and Eve in some kind of way, well, this is no longer happening. And so what, what is actually the status of those embryos? How do we work that out? Who's going to work it out, and will it make any difference? Uh, there was a fascinating and horrifying video uh, about a, a, an imaginary plant called ectolife. I don't know if you saw it. End of last year, it's on YouTube. There's a science ed educator called Hasham Al-Ghali who produced this thing, ectolife. And if you can imagine uh, the matrix, you know the matrix where they're all the bodies are in the vats? This was like a, a pristine... A cleaned up version of that, sparkling and white and antiseptic of babies in artificial wombs. Um, and and it, was a, it was imagined as a, a video from the company that, that, that had run this facility, the Ecto Life facility, where they, I think they can, you know, they can have 30,000 babies gestating in their thing. And it promised the end of infertility to reverse population decline, to remove the pain and danger of uh, childbirth because you can just press a button when the baby's ready. It promised gene editing to remove uh, risk of hereditary disease. It promised an enhanced experience of the child's development in the womb because while the baby is in the lab, they can have speakers so the parents can actually talk and the baby can hear their voice. Or if you want your baby to be a great musician, you can play mu the right kind of music to it in the womb. And mum and dad can wear a haptic suit and feel the actual baby's movements and as if... And so not only can mum enjoy that experience of pregnancy, but the haptic suit can be passed around the family. And Hashem Al-Ghali says, you know, that we're not there yet, but we will be soon. And the question becomes, if we've lost the difference between what is natural and what is human choice and technology... How do we begin to decide whether or not that is an appropriate thing to do? Given that we already live in a world where if you're wealthy enough, surrogacy is fairly common. Witness thousands of unclaimed babies in Ukraine because it's been too dangerous or inconvenient for their parents to get them from Ukrainian mothers 
who have been at the center of surrogacy for quite a while. You thought the original sin stuff was depressing, didn't you? So, let's think about transhumanism. And I'll, I'll talk about transhumanism for a minute, and then we'll have time for questions. What is transhumanism? This is the word of the day. Um, it's really human upgrade. Uh, there's a, a very, I hesitate to say very good book. There is a very good book, uh, it's quite chilling, uh, by Yuval Noah Harari called Homo Deus. Um, it's very well written. He's a historian, not a scientist, but he's sort of projecting what, what could be coming. So he wrote a history of humanity. Um, and then, you know, having thought about Homo sapiens, thinking man, he then says, well, we're, we're moving now into Homo Deus, God-like man. Uh, does that sound familiar? You will become like what? Oh. So it's very, it's very interesting. And Yuval Noah Harari says there are basically three stages to this transhumanist dream. Uh, biological engineering, cyborg engineering, and non-organic beings. So biological engineering, a lot of this is predicated on there's been an evolutionary process that's got us to where we are. Um, and evolution has been about survival of the fittest and our genes finding machines to, to replicate themselves in the most efficient way possible. I mean, again, efficiency is at the heart of this, but we've, gone, we've come a long way, haven't we, from protozoa? And, and we've come a long way from more primitive apes. And we've, we've ended up as this quite sophisticated species that is also wreaking havoc in the world and causing all kinds of environmental damage. And the chances of species survival are quite slim. And in any case, we're rather dysfunctional because we do things like get ill and die. But we are now, thanks to the scientific and technological and and now information revolutions, we are capable of artificially speeding up the evolutionary process and directing it in the directions that we want. So we can help evolution along the way by rewriting our genetic code, by rewiring brain circuits, neurocircuits, by the use of drugs to deal with different problems. And so they're not just being used for medical purposes, but actually to enhance our, our minds and, and the efficiency and the use of our minds. Biological engineering, then cyborg engineering. So rather than actually working with just the meat computer or the meat robot, uh, we can actually start to improve the robot. So I'm a bad pianist. And I wish I was a good pianist. And what if you could come to me and say, you know, Matthew, your hands, they're reasonably dexterous on a, on a piano keyboard, and they're reasonably strong, but they get tired, and you play a lot of wrong notes. They're not as precise as they could be. They're not as strong as they could be. And Matthew, you're 48. Think what you're going to be like when you're 78. Let me give you a bionic hand. Two, in fact. That will be stronger, faster, more dexterous, more subtle, and that won't wear out. And when things do wear out, you can just screw in a new bit. What about artificial eyes? And I want to say, look, if you're born without hands, or if your arms are damaged in an accident, what a wonderful gift an, a, 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 an artificial hand is. It's a different order of thing to come to someone with healthy functional hands and go, I can give you something better. Artificial eyes. Again, if you're born blind or, or if you become blind, what a gift. I mean, you, if you've ever seen those videos of the little children who for the first time see their parents. But I'm just a bit short-sighted and so could never be a fighter pilot. I'm a lot short-sighted and there are other reasons I could never be a fighter pilot. But, or, or what about if we put nanorobots in your bloodstream? That you won't be aware they're there. And they'll be able to trundle around your bloodstream, observing, cleaning up problems before. So you will never even know you have a problem because the nanorobots will already have dealt with it. Clean, repair, diagnose, it's brilliant. You need never talk to your doctor again. He can just look at his computer and see what's going on. And then the third stage 
is, and some people are going, well, that's been the truth since COVID, isn't it? But yeah. Non-organic beings, third stage, where the organic brain is no longer the control. So you've, we replace bits of us. What if we can replace the brain? So the organic brain is no longer the command and control center, and through the use of artificial intelligence and intelligent software, we can begin to upload ourselves. And so you, you will know Harari has this kind of thing about what if one day you could be enjoying, your body could be enjoying a holiday in Australia while your brain is still at home. And, and the heart of transhuman, the transhumanist projects is what's called GRIN technologies. Genetic, robotic, information, and nanotechnology. And, you know, caveat, there's a, there's a good book uh, by um, John Lennox called 2084 that deals with some of this. And he, he does have like, um, a professor of computer science that he quotes at some point who says, we, this is basically fantasy world. We'll never actually be able to get to some of the things these people are talking about. And, you know, I don't know whether that's true or not. I have no idea. Um, and I'm not even going to try and make wild predictions of where we could end up in the next few years or the next few decades or the next couple of centuries. But I think it's important for us to reflect on what is this doing to our understanding of what it means to be human? What is this doing to our desires for ourselves and our children and our grandchildren? And let me say as well, what's it doing for our fears and our anxiety. I mean, I don't know how you felt about some of the things I was just talking about. I know how I feel about some of them. And the dangers of just being sort of horrified and paralyzed as well. What is it that's driving transhumanism, though, before we uh, stop for questions? I think fundamentally it is a refusal of God-given created limits. And I think it's an understandable refusal of God-given created limits. Ecclesiastes says, you have set eternity in our hearts, but in such a way we don't know the end from the beginning. And so we are, we are creatures who are designed by God to be immortal. Death is an enemy, and it is understandable that we would fight against it. But those created limits, both as created and as fallen, they're given by God. He has made us as profoundly limited creatures. And the problem is we don't want to be creatures. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. And so I can't precisely define where the boundaries lie. There are ways that we, we do transgress our creaturely limits, like driving to Keswick, that seemed to me entirely fine. Open heart surgery. Um, but there's a difference between repairing medically, temporarily, and that's what doctors have always known, isn't it? Until very recently, you don't go to the doctor to get completely fixed. You get a temporary repair to improve the quality of life for as long as you can. But patient care is much more holistic than just there's this technical problem. So refusal of God-given limits, that has deep roots in the origins of the modern world and modern science. And I can't spend a lot of time doing this, but going back to Francis Bacon in the 16th century and to René, our old friend René Descartes as well. But here's C.S. Lewis in The Abolition of Man. This might be the most important couple of sentences I'll say today. For the wise men of old, the cardinal problem had been how to conform the soul to reality. I think, I think that's, we've probably got the, have I got the quote on the slide? Yeah. For the wise men of old, the cardinal problem had been how to conform the soul to reality. And the solution had been knowledge, self-discipline, and virtue. That is to say, we know there are limits. There's such a thing as reality, and it's real reality. And my God-given responsibility is to conform my life to that reality. And that is the cultivation of virtue, to live in harmony with the world God has created and the creature God has made me to be. 
for magic and applied science, he's talking about the 17th century. Uh, applied science is kind of um, technology kind of stuff. But for magic and applied science alike, the problem is how to subdue reality to the wishes of men. The solution is technique. And both, in the practice of this technique, are ready to do things hitherto uh, regarded as disgusting and impious. So you see the difference. There's, there's a step shift in the 17th century in the, we in the Western world between the idea that the goal of life is to conform myself to reality, shifting to the goal of life for all of humanity is to subdue reality to what I want. And so the driver is no longer an external reality. The driver is my will and my desires and my plans. There's a rejection of God-given natures and ends. This is what God has made things to be. And a prioritizing of human projects and agendas and desires. And it led to extraordinary advances and discoveries. Breathtaking. but a huge change. And downstream of that, as, as our technologies, uh, as our medical skill uh, has, has advanced, we get to the idea that really there should be no limits on humans at all. No limits on our desires at all. We need never be paralyzed by our weakness and our limitation and our frustrations. We can, if we work together well enough, we can, we can be whoever we want to be. So here's a long quotation in, a, in three parts, I think, and I'm just going to read straight through it from Homo Deus by Yuval Noah Harari. Modern science and modern culture don't think of death as a metaphysical mystery, and they certainly don't view death as the source of life's meaning. Rather, for modern people, death is a technical problem that we can and should solve. Humans don't die because a figure in a black cloak taps them on the shoulder or because God decreed it or because mortality is an essential part of some great cosmic plan. Humans always die due to some technical glitch. The heart stops pumping blood. The main artery is clogged by fatty deposits. He gives a, a, an ongoing list. And what's responsible for those kinds of technical problems? <coughs> Excuse me, other technical problems. And every technical problem has a technical solution. We don't need to wait for the second coming in order to overcome death. A couple of geeks in a lab can do it. True, at present we don't have solutions to all technical problems. But this is precisely why we invest so much time and money in researching cancer, germs, genetics, and nanotechnology. One or two things to say. Um, let's think about death for a minute. On that understanding, death is not a moral matter. He's very clear about that. It's not the source of life's meaning. It's not connected to sin and its consequences, in other words. And it's very striking, isn't it? I mean, he's a very gifted writer, and rhetorically it's very skillful. Humans don't die because a figure in a black cloak taps them on the shoulder. Well, we all know that or because God decreed it, or because mortality. You know, it's just as absurd to think that God has decreed death as it is to think that Terry Pratchett's death comes to you, speaking in capital letters, carrying his scythe. It's not connected to sin and its consequences. So death is not a moral issue. Death is a purely technical problem, and technical problems have technical solutions. Just notice the assumption as we go to analyzing for a moment. The assumption is not dying is good. Now, if you live on an evolutionary understanding of reality, purely evolution, now, I don't want to get into that debate. Um, so don't ask me questions about it, because I don't have answers um, that I'm willing to share publicly, at least. Um, if, you, if you live on a purely evolutionary understanding of reality, why is death a bad thing? Death is actually just a means of advance. 
not just the, the only means of advancement, it's all part of it. Why is not dying good? There's no metaphysical reason. We just don't like it. But why don't we like it? Why don't we like dying? I don't, you know, rab rabbits will escape predators and try to avoid death, but there's no great angst at the end of a rabbit's life as far as I can see from observation. It's just one of those things. And we, you know, we might feel sad to see the little bunny lying at the side of the road. And we might, you know, when you're pushing the pushchair and there's the sort of dead sparrow, you might sort of wheel it round so your child can't see it because it might look a bit, but it's not. It's just a bird. Why is not dying good? Notice as well the false what I call the false dichotomy of causation. Sorry. Um, what's the cause of dying? Not God, but a technical problem. Why not both? When the Lord called my father home, it was the Lord who called my father home, and he, in this world he died. How did that happen? He had a massive heart attack and died on the spot. There was some technical glitch in his heart that made it stop beating. And that was what the Lord used to end his life. And notice the, the question, I think, for Yuval Noah Harari is not, what is human life for? He's not that interested in questions of meaning. The question is more, how do human machines work? And how can we improve them? So back to the C.S. Lewis sort of thing. In the world before the rise of modern science, generally speaking, philosophers, theologians, and people in general were interested in two particular questions about anything. What is it? And what is it for? And we had rather crude and clumsy understandings about exactly how things work. But it was really important to know, what is this thing called a human being? And what is a human being for? And the great minds of history gave intense thought to this and came up with profound answers. In the modern world, we're less interested in what is it and what is it for. And we're more interested in what's it made from? How does it work? Where does it come from? And what can I do with it? And so we have got this extraordinary, extraordinary explosion of knowledge about detailed technical things about how things work. How does life work? How do cells work? How do subatomic particles work? And we can make these things do stuff. And we can fit all the world's knowledge on a little square thing that fits in our pocket but we are much less interested in the question of what is this thing actually, rather than what can I change it into, and less interested in what is it for than what can I make it do. Let's stop there. Uh, questions? That's an amazing question that I had not anticipated at all. Hence, uh, I nearly spat my coffee out. Um, let me repeat the question. Yeah, it's conceivable that there will be artificial humans walking around in, our, in, the, in at least some of our lifetimes, uh, you know, maybe more likely in yours than in mine, I don't know. But um, given that God, you know, chose the electron before the foundation of the world, should we evangelize them? And I think this is one of the, this is one of the questions, you see, where we, where we need philosophers and theologians to be going, what is it? Um, when, when I put artificial in front of human, What's that word artificial doing? Ma Man-made human. So, what, you know, one of the, we can't go there, but one of the fundamental distinctions in terms of God himself and then in terms of us as creatures is between begetting and making. And so the doctrine of the Trinity and the doctrine of creation teach us that begetting is of a different order of existence than making and that God the Son is begotten not made, if you say the Nicene Creed. And when you beget, you produce something with the same nature as yourself. And when you make, you make something that is less than yourself. 
And one of the problems that Oliver O'Donovan identifies in his, uh, in his book, Begotten or Made, he's talking about artificial reproduction and saying, certainly the technologies we had back in the 80s and we still have now, we are producing, still using um, gametes from humans. You know, there is, even if the actual process of reproduction is rather artificially engineered, it is using uh, male and female gametes. There is a mother and a father. But we are making, begetting more and more like making. And so the way we start to relate to children changes and they become much more projects of their parents' wills and decisions. I'm just going to stop there because I could now say some really controversial things, but I won't do that. Um, and so one of the questions we have to ask is when we put artificial in front of human, we mean man-made. Not ma man-begotten, but man-made. And what is that doing? And uh, who are we making? What are we making? And also, what are we saying about ourselves? That maybe we can be made and remade in very plastic ways. So I, I, so I don't know the answer to your question, um, because I don't even know what they are. Um, and my worry is that we'll get there and then be looking around going, now how do we relate to, rather than thinking, should we even get there? Yeah, gentlemen there, yeah. Well, the, the use of the word owns there is so important because we're already there with surrogacy. Who owns this child? May I say, if you... If you think about a parent's relationship to a child as ownership, you're already in a profoundly troubling place. But that's where we are. And the questions of who owns and who has rights over children, is it parents, schools, the state? We're there. Um, and I, I, just, I just want so thank you. I just want to flag up that word owns. No human should own another human. No caveats. That begetting produces an, an equal who requires love and nurture, but actually, what are you doing as a parent? You're raising a son or a daughter to become a brother or a sister. I mean, eschatologically, that's I'm saying eschatologically. I mean, when Jesus returns, that's where we are, isn't it? We're all brothers and sisters in Christ. And actually, even within the church now, within marriage, I think husbands and wives are to relate to one another as husbands and wives. That is a unique and distinctive relationship. And at the same time, there is a sense in which it's a brother-sister relationship. Already and eternally it will be. You won't be married. And similarly with your children, you want them to become your brothers and sisters in Christ. Equal heirs of the kingdom of God. Um, and as soon as we start to go, we're talking about making, then we are talking about ownership, because making and ownership belong together in a way that if someone has made it, they own it until they sell it to someone or give it to someone else. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So we've eradicated smallpox. We are getting better and better and better at treating cancer. We do think cars are good, mostly. So maybe some of us don't. Um, I need to think more about this, um, is the first thing to say. I think the, the Elul's distinction between a society that has technologies and a technological society is profoundly important just for enabling us to step back, excuse me, and go... I just swim in technology and can't see what the problem is with it. And so let's try and imagine myself in a, in a different environment. And then the third thing is, uh, I, think, I think he might have been a Catholic, um, Ivan Illich, who, who is one of, you know, one of the deep dives coming up for me is to spend some time in the work of Ivan Illich. Um, and there's an American Christian, um, a Presbyterian called Michael, someone whose name has just escaped me, who's done a lot of work on Illich. Um, if I remember his name, I'll say it out loud, because his, his substack and his essays are just really interesting. 
And Illich talks about technology needing to think about it on a human scale and says what we need are tools for conviviality. That actually we need technologies that don't inhibit warm, loving, natural, friendly human relationships. Um, and so things need to be on a human scale. And, and Illich has a, a, a book on medicine, which I don't understand well enough to try and replicate the argument because I've not actually read it. I've read sort of bits and bobs of summaries. But he just says, look, the, the relationship, our relationship with our doctors has changed. Um, where you're now a, you, you present yourself to your doctor as a problem to be solved. Rather than having a family GP who knows you and your parents and your wife and your children and is concerned for your life in your community and your dignity, are there medical procedures at the end of life that are actually invasive and undignified? Yeah. Yeah, there are. And I'm not saying, therefore, don't do it, but I'm saying recognize the drive actually to extend life as long as possible that might be, there might be times when we just go, I don't want that. Why, why is it that almost nobody dies at home anymore? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Why is it that many of us will not have seen a dead body. That actually we'll turn up at a funeral and see the coffin. A hundred years ago, that wouldn't have been the case. And in other, you know, I think probably still in Ireland and, and in other countries, that wouldn't be the case. And so what, what are we saying about how we interact with people and death and people and health? So I, I just think we need to ask those questions and say, what is actually a human life that acknowledges we're limited, that acknowledges death is real, that acknowledges suffering is inevitable, and that sometimes the cleanest, most hygienic, most technically proficient place is not the place you want to spend your final hours. That may be spending your final hours in your own bed with your family around you and a bit of additional pain is better, that it's, it's, it's more dignifying because it's setting you in the place you really belong in this life. And it's probably more, more I don't know what the word is, for your family, rather than them having to navigate the hospital and the nurses and the doctors and the... And I'm not, I'm not trying to lay down rules for what we should do here. I'm just reflecting out loud about different visions of what it means to be human. And if you're comfortable with saying we are weak and frail and our bodies will fail us and what matters in those moments is the people who are around us who love us, it's a very different view of medicine. It's a very different view of a doctor's vocation, actually, to care for a person rather than to solve a medical problem. Now, of course, solving medical problems as part of caring for a person is part of a doctor's vocation but they're not glorified car mechanics. You know, I take my phone into the Apple shop, I take my car into the garage, I take my body to the doctor. One of those things is not like the others. Let's begin a Christian response in the five minutes, four minutes we have left. I'm just trying to work out where I wanted to get to. Here's where I'm going to get to. What is a human life for? That's the question we have to ask ourselves. Not just what is a human, but what is a human life therefore for? In other words, what is good for us? Transhumanist project is offering something, is offering a kind of good. Something that purports to be good, is it actually good for us as the actual creatures God has made us? What's a human life for? What, what is good for us? Who gets to decide? 
and who gets to tell us. I do not get to decide for myself. That's called sin. In the technological society, human goals take precedence over God-given ends. And that's Genesis 3. You will become like God, knowing good and evil. Which I take it to mean something like, (coughs) it's a question of they're being offered wisdom and power in God's world to replace God and to make the judgment calls about what is good and evil and what they want. And that is the way we live. That is a, that is a Genesis 3 humanity. And that is where we are with the extraordinary, you know, can you imagine the extraordinary thoughts that would have gone through Adam and Eve's head if they could see the way that we can control reality now? Created reality is God made us for himself. So what is the chief and highest end of man? Uh, I think this is on the next slide. Uh, The chief and highest end of man is to glorify God and fully to enjoy him forever. Both of those things are really important. Glorify God and fully enjoy him forever. From him and through him and to him are all things. So here's where I want to finish. God loved the idea of you. He loved the idea of you so much that he loved you into existence. And he loved you into existence because he wants you for himself. And he wants you for himself so that he can give you himself fully, unreservedly, forever. That is what salvation is. God in Christ taking you for himself. God in Christ by his spirit giving you himself forever. In the presence of the Lord is fullness of joy and eternal pleasures at your right hand. Whom have I in heaven but you? And on earth there is nothing that I desire except you. And so actually, you know, transhumanism is a response to suffering and limitation and death that is so pathetic in what it offers. When an eternal ocean and fountain of joy and beauty and goodness is ours in the Lord Jesus Christ. Shall we pray? Father, we're so frustrated by the limitations of ourselves and our lives. Uh, And it's right that we hate suffering. And it's right that we loathe death because there are enemies and they are evils that have come into your good world because of our sin. And we pray that you would help us to have a right hatred of these things, but also a right joy and contentment with our lives now and your goodness in the midst of our pains and our struggles and our fears and what lies ahead and our losses and the things we look back on with nostalgia and grief. We trust you that in the midst of all of these things, you are good and you do good. And it's good for us that we're afflicted, that we might learn your statutes. And that now as we bow before you, there is joy and pleasure in you. And we ask, Heavenly Father, as we envy the wicked, their comfort, their their, their riches, their security and stability in this life, that we would not become fools and deny you by our words and our lives, but that we would be able to confess with the psalmist that we have 
no one and nothing in heaven besides you, but that in heaven is the Lord Jesus Christ who has ascended and sits at your right hand. And what more could we want than him? Um, and, and therefore that on earth, we would have no good thing apart from you. Give us grace, Heavenly Father, today to set our minds on things above where Christ is seated at your right hand. Fill us with the, the confidence and the hope and the joy that comes from knowing that when Christ, who is our life, appears, we will appear with him in glory. Lord, in our weakness and frailty, we look to Jesus and we look to the forgiveness of our sins and we look to the resurrection of the dead and to the wonderful fact that one day these weak and frail and suffering bodies will be raised glorious and immortal and we will be with you and see you and know you and delight in you forever. That is what we want because we want you. We're amazed that you wanted us. Thank you that you did. Shape us so that we want you. In Jesus' name, amen.